Welcome to Woodland Heights Free Will Baptist Church television broadcast. As you'll notice, we have no, no people here today. Seats are empty, and uh, so we've decided to come to you on our regular program on Saturday and Sunday nights, uh, as you've been seeing, but we're going to do a, our program in, in advance, record it with nobody here, because of the coronavirus outbreak. It's sad that 151 nations around this world has now been infected by the coronavirus. We need to pray, pray much. We need to pray much for our, lo our own localities, our own churches that uh, can't meet. And it looks like now it's going to be June the 10th before we can come back into assembly of 10 or more people. And so we need to pray much for, for our local churches and our local pastors and church leaders. We also need to pray much for our nation and our state as our politicians and our government leaders are trying to do all that they can do and the scientists are working hard to find a cure for this. But we need to pray for them as they do what they need to do to control this outbreak and to kill this virus. We need to pray much for other countries around the world. It's a time for peace and unity as we fight this invisible enemy together. So as we gather together, oh, and also we need to pray for our doctors and our nurses in our local community and, and around the world as they work to try to maintain the health of individuals. So as we're thinking about that, and uh, thank you for joining, how about join with me in prayer right now as we take this to the Lord uh, and ask his blessings and ask his, his quick hand to touch in America. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we come before your throne. Thank you, dear God, for the opportunity to address our, our members and our visitors who we normally have and, and our community as a whole over the medium of television and Internet and our website. And Father, Lord, I pray, dear God, that uh, you would reach down in our community as, as some has already been touched by this virus that's going around. Many died and many more are yet to be infected, they say. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that your healing hand be upon individuals, be upon churches, be upon the nations, and be upon our world, Lord, as they go through this time. Lord, there are many questions being asked, why, and why this, and why that? And I don't have the answer to it. Nobody, no man does, but I, I'm so glad that I serve a Savior who knows what's going on. I'm so glad that you have not uh, advocated your, th your throne, you've not left it, but you're still in control of man and all the diseases and sickness that plagues this world. Father, I pray, dear God, now that you just bless us as we look into your word. Father, help us to take the word of God and explain it to, to our viewers in a manner that it would be a blessing to them and even maybe convicting to them. Now, Father, Lord, just uh, guide as we look into the word of God. Holy Spirit, direct as, as I say the things that I need to say, nothing more, nothing less. Now, Father, again, I thank you for what you're going to do. In Christ's name, amen. Again, welcome to Woodland Heights. We're glad that you have chosen to, to uh, turn your television and, and Internet our way. And uh, this being Easter season, Sunday being Palm Sunday and the 12th being Easter, we were hoping that we could be back in God's house to celebrate Easter together. It doesn't look like that's what's going to happen. But uh, we thank God for the medium of television and uh, being able to send this as a recorded service out your way. But today we're going to look at the, su the subject of Easter, the, the time period of Easter. And we're going to look at the seven foundational truths or teachings of Christ that he gave us from the cross of Calvary. Sometimes uh, in the past we have heard this talked about the seven words of Christ, with the seven sayings of Christ. But they're more than words and more than sayings. They are actually a uh, foundational teaching of the Christian believer's life. We we're going to take a text from John 19, verse 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Today will be the first of two sermons. We will look one next week, the second part of it next week, which we will look at. Uh, We'll, we'll look at Christ's teaching from the cross. We will see, a, see Christ dying for our sins. And while he was dying for our sins, he was teaching some fundamental truths that we need to look at 
and apply to make our life as a Christian believer much greater and much, much more effective. And these are just simply doctrines that he gave us from the cross. The horror of his death, which began in the Garden of Eden, with Judas denying him as the Savior, as the Redeemer, as King, uh, this horror is, is hard to look at, hard to understand what Christ went through. But just remember one thing. He went through it all for you and for me and for all of mankind. Uh, his, the horror that began at the Garden of Eden now ends at the cross. And uh, so I want to look at uh, four of the seven lessons or messages or doctrines that he was giving us from Christ. Let me give you all seven to begin with, and we'll look at the first four today and the next three next week. We see the basic teaching of forgiveness, the basic teaching of salvation, the basic teaching of, forge uh, of forsakeness, and the teaching of compassion. And then next week we'll look at the basic teaching of suffering, the teaching of God's care, and the fact that his plan for mankind and the salvation is finished. So today let's look first of all in John chapter 23 and verse 32 through 34 at the teaching of forgiveness. And we will find the scripture says, and there were also two other male factors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and one on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As Christ was dying on, on the cross for our sins and our guilt, he looked down from that cross and he saw a great diversity of people. He saw people from all walks of life and all types of wealth and poverty. He saw people from near and far who had gathered that day for that great execution, that great crucifixion of the king of Israel, which, which was denied, he was denied, of course, by Israel. He was denied being their king. But he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Hanging from the cross, he looked at this great diversity of people. And there were Jews and Gentiles and bond and free and slaves and politicians and religious leaders and yes, all of sinful mankind was there. All of there, there may have been members of the Sanhedrin there, but they made they were made priests and and uh, religious leaders and politicians and all these people were there. They weren't there in support of Christ. They were there in opposition of Christ. They were there not to have their sins forgiven, but to sin even greater, as they said, "Crucify him, crucify him," and was rejoicing in his crucifixion. So we find all these, and yes, you may ask, Pastor, why did you include mankind today? Why did, you, why did you think he was talking about mankind? Because he said, Father, forgive them, as he looked down at his people. Forgive all sinners, because all men are sinners and in need of a Savior, and in need of forgiveness of their sins. We find Paul writing to the Roman church in chapter 3, and verse 9 and 12, no, in no wise, for we have uh, both proved before that both Jews and Gentiles, they're both under sin. And it is written, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone astray and, and altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So that's why he included us, because we're all sinners. You're born in sin, the Word of God says. In, in sin, my mother conceived me. And in sinful world, I was born. And I inherited that atomic, atomic nature of sin. And we all did. You and I do. Some people think they would be above sin. Some people think they've never sinned. But I want to tell you what. Jesus Christ said you had the Word of God is very plain throughout from Genesis to Revelations that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And uh, so, so we need to realize that, that we are a group of sinful people and that God could not look on sin and Christ died for our sins. 
even in our sinful condition, as we, we could see ourselves, and you need to see ourselves at the foot of the cross, looking up at one who died for us, who was dying for our sins at the same time. But we were in so sinful nature, we couldn't do anything about it. God didn't, couldn't look on sin. He, he couldn't uh, accept us in our sinful condition. But I'm so thankful that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit had a plan. And that plan was that Jesus Christ come and die on the cross of Calvary to forgive men from, for their sins. Peter writes in 1 Peter 3.24, 3.24, who, who his own self bare our sins on, in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by, the, by whose stripes we are healed. Every one of us are sinful by nature, and every one of us com com commits sin. But while we were so sinful and we couldn't do anything about it, we couldn't control our destiny, we couldn't uh, go to heaven on our own good works because all are sinful, Christ is dying on the tree, on the cross, to, to forgive man and his sins. He took my sin upon himself. And I'm so glad to know that God chose to take my sins and my guilt and lay them on the cross, of, uh, on the shoulders of the Son of God as he was there dying on the cross. Isaiah writes that we all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord had laid on him the iniquity or the sin of us all. I'm so glad that God loved me when I was so unlovable. I'm so glad that God didn't give up on me, but he, see, but he gave Christ for me. And I'm so glad that you got this morning... That, or this evening, that God hath, has placed on Christ my sin and your sin, and that he took them to the cross, and he, he, there he gave himself for our sins. Since Christ died on the cross, beloved, listen, Christian, since, died on the cross, since Christ died on the cross for the forgiveness of sin, why do Christians have such a hard time forgiving others as Christ himself uh, taught us in his model prayer? in Luke chapter 11 and verse 4. And forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Can we really expect God to honor the, our, our, our forgiveness of sin or to forgive us of our daily sins if we cannot forgive those who sin against us? There should be nobody that you couldn't wrap, wrap your arms around and say, I forgive you. There could not be any person there should not be any person that you couldn't wrap your arms around and say, I forgive you and God forgive you and, and uh, bring that brother into a closer, or sister into a closer relationship with God. But I'm so glad to know this morning that he forgave our sins and he'll forgive everyone of their sins and their indebtedness to him. And, and so while dying on the tree, he taught us some beautiful lessons one of which is the doctrine of forgiveness. So this, the, today, if you're watching this program, if you're listening to, the, to this old preacher, uh, if you know somebody that's got, that you've got somebody that's something against, maybe they've done something to you, maybe you just thought they did, and you've been holding a grudge, I want to tell you this morning that holding a grudge is only going to hurt you. Unforgiveness is only going to hurt you. And it's going to do so because it will block, listen, it will block your communication and your f relationship with God Almighty. So sin is a barrier that needs to be forgiven. And Christ taught that hanging from the tree. Then not only did he talk to us about forgiveness, but he gives us a basic doctrine and a basic principle of salvation. We find in Luke 23, uh, 33 through 43, these words, And when they were coming to the place, which was called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the male factors, one on the right and one on the left. And one of the male factors which, hanged, which were hanged railed upon him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the others answering, rebuking him, saying, Does not thou fear God? seeing that thou art of the same condemnation. And we justly, before we receive our due rewards of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. 
And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, listen, verily, verily, I say unto you, or verily, truly, I say unto you, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. As they crucified him, hanging on the right and left with people who were seditionists, maybe murderers, robbers, thieves. It doesn't tell us what these two men done. It doesn't tell us the crime that they done. Why, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, sin is sin, and we need to quit looking for big sins and little sins and just realize that sin is sin, and all men are sinners, and all men need a Savior. It doesn't matter what color you are, Red, yellow, black, or white, they're all precious in God's sight. If one, if one accepts forgiveness for their sins from God, it will lead him to the path of salvation by Christ. Forgiveness from Christ leads to salvation by Christ. You see, the Word of God says only God can forgive sin. Luke chapter 5 and verse 21, the scribes and the Pharisees begin to reason, uh, saying, or argue amongst themselves, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemings? Who can forgive sin but God alone? I want to tell you this morning, you can trust in everything you want to. You can trust in all the gods of this world, all the man-made ideas of worship, all the man-made ideas of trusting in this God or this deity or that deity or whatever they may be. You see, but they can't do anything for you. Only God, who is the only God, by the way. There is none like him. There is none others. Uh, he is God and God alone. And he alone can forgive sin because of the death of Christ on the cross of Calvary. So we find the basic teaching that God is the forgiver of sin. Not only is, God, is it God that forgives sins, he says in, in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm so glad that, that God knows that I live in this fleshly body and you in your fleshly body, and we're not perfect by any means, and we can't live above sin, and, and sin affects our lives either directly or indirectly all the time. But if we do sin, we have an advocate. We have a, 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 a priest, a high priest that is touched by us. And, and uh, Christ, for, God forgives sins, and, and Christ is the, gives the one that gives the salvation. Only Christ, and only in him, and only believing in him, can we have such great salvation. Luke writes in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name given among, uh, under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Listen, trust in all, all these other things if you want to. It's just like trusting in, a, in one of our offering plates to get you to heaven. But what money you put in there is not going to get you to heaven. Just because you honor that God, you look at it as a God, it's not going to get you to heaven. Only person that can give salvation is Jesus Christ. And the only way for salvation is by grace through faith, by the way. It's grace in the finished work of cross on the cross of Calvary. Christ is the only way to heaven, only way to the Father. And, and he, we do that simply by grace through faith. Paul writes to the Ephesians church in 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. As I said earlier, none of us is good enough to go to heaven. None of us is rich enough to go to heaven. None of us is powerful enough to work our way to heaven. Salvation is a unique plan of God whereby a just God gives a sinless son to die for the unjust and the sinners alike uh, on the cross of Calvary. And through him, we can come to the Father. Through him, we can have salvation by grace. Quit working and start living for God. Quit trying to work your way to heaven. Quit trying to give your way to heaven. Quit trying to, to analyze your way to heaven and just trust Jesus. Just call on his name and ask him to save you and redeem you from your sins. He'll give you forgiveness and he'll give you salvation. 
And so salvation is only through Christ because forgiveness is only through God. And then thirdly, we find the teaching of forsakeness. We find in Matthew chapter 27, verse 45 and 46. Let's read this. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Sabatani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What a statement to come from Christ. What a statement that God that Christ uttered off of his lips and off of that royal tongue to us sinners when he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now we know scripture teaches perfectly that Christ that God the Father had to turn his back on the Son while he was dying for sin, that he could not, that he could not look at his Son, uh, who was this ultimate Lamb of God, who was the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, dying for a world of sin. How heartbreaking it must have been for God to do that. Uh, we who have children and grandchildren, we would find it absolutely hard to turn our back on them for any reason. And God found it hard, I believe, to turn his back on Christ. But, but he had to because Christ was hanging on that cross, dying for the sins of all of mankind. How gracious God was. How gracious God is today. How powerful Christ is, and is, it was and is, to take us who were sinful, who were in the family of the devil, and translate us into the family of God. To make us who were sinners into saints. Listen at Paul as he writes, I believe it, to the Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Listen to this. Take this to heart. As Christ was hanging on that tree, Dying for sinful men. All these diversity of people that was there around that cross. All these people that was there mocking him and crying out against him and have railing accusations against him. Even the one that was on the right hand, uh, was on the hand of God, dying on the cross with Christ, looked at him and said, why don't you just save yourself if you be God? Why don't you save yourself and save us? And making fun of who he was and, and making accusations against him. Such sinful people. You say, my, that's awful. Take a look in the mirror. Take a look in the mirror. You'll find yourself as one of those people standing there at the cross. But even as God forsook him, even as God took and turned his back on him, even as as he was dying for such sinners as I, he made us a promise in the word of God. He had given us a basic doctrine already concerning this, but now he was proving it, he, that he would never leave us nor forsake us. Once we come to, to have forgiveness of sin, have salvation by Christ, he, he gives us the promise, he gives us the surety that he would never leave us nor forsake us. In the great commission that he gave us in the book of Matthew and other times in, 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 in other scriptures, uh, he said this, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. He gives us a promise that if we'll go out and do his job, if we'll go out and do his work as he's called us to do, and he's called everybody in, in Christianity to be busy workmen for him. I know we read Ephesians 8, uh, 2, 8 and 9, but verse 10 is very popular. It, it's still the word of God too. It says, for we are his workmen created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So God expects us to be working for him. God expects us to be saved by his grace and kept by his power and forgiven by himself. 
And he says this, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'll go in with you to the end of the age or to the end of the world. All this was done, Matthew writes in 20, chapter 26. All this was done that the scriptures might be fulfilled uh, and all his disciples forsook him and fled. Oh, I can, I can sort of understand why Judas wasn't there. He had betrayed him and he went out and hung himself and died. But I couldn't understand why all these people who was there, who had followed him for three and a half years. Peter, oh, we talk about Peter being so, so bad, and Peter denying him as the, crow, as the rooster crowed three times. Peter denying him twice. Peter telling, I don't know him. I'm not with him. I haven't followed him. And we make a big deal about Peter doing it. We make a big deal about Peter forsaking Christ. But listen to the word of God here. It says, and all the disciples forsook him and fled. All of them, every one of them left him hanging on the cross. Every one of them left him dying on the cross. They should have known better. They did. They should have known his teaching, and they did. But let me just tell you, they're sinners just like we. They needed a Savior just like we did. And you say, can somebody walk three and a half years with Christ and not be saved? There's people who's been attending church and sitting on the same pew for 35 to 40 years and, and acting like they're Christians but never been saved. Listen, these disciples forsook him and fled. They feared, his, they feared the enemies. They feared the ones around them, and they didn't want to die for him at that particular time. Later we find where all of them did. All of them died a horrible death, uh, even being boiled in oil as John was. All of them came back from forsaking him. How many today? We, we talk about the people around the cross Forsaking him. We talk about people around that cross, Peter, John, and, and Matthew, and, and all the disciples that had walked with him for, the, for these years had listened to his teaching. They had heard this doctrine. They had heard this teaching before. And we say, oh, they're so awful. They're so bad. But wait a minute. How many people today are forsaking Christ? How many people today are not following him as they should? How many people today are following, uh, forsaking Christ, forsaking his house of worship, forsaking fellowship with the brothers and sisters as we walk together? And so many people are fellowship, and we need fellowship. We need fellowship with God, but we need fellowship with the beloved brothers and sisters in the house of God. We find Paul writing once again, I believe, to the, to the church in Hebrews chapter 10. He says this, and let us consider one another and, pro and, and provoke them unto love to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as a manner of some is, but so much the more, exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see that day approaching. Listen, Jesus is coming. The day of Christ is at hand. We're right now going through a terrible thing, and 51 nations across this world are infected by a virus that nobody really knows how to kill. Nobody really knows how to destroy that while it's destroying and taking the lives of many people. Listen, we need, to, we need to be faithful to God. We need to be faithful to his church. We need to be faithful to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to lift them up. We need to hold our hand, their hands up in this particular time and every day. The Bible says fellowship as we fellowship one with another. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sins. It exhorts me and it encourages me when I can get together with my church family. And oh, how it hurts that we can't for a while. And oh, how it hurts because churches can't meet and, and worship together. I understand why. I'm not questioning the government. It's not the test of religious freedom, but it's the test of what's right and what's wrong for the health and welfare of the people of this church and your church and all around the world. But I'm so glad today that he never forsakes us. He never will leave us, but he'll go with us to the end of the age. Listen, I'm not always who I should be. I'm not, sin, I'm not the sinless one. Jesus Christ is the only sinless one. You aren't either. But it sure does help us to get together 
and look at the Word of God and His teachings and, and preach the Word of God, sing the songs of Zion, and lift up the name of Jesus and give Him honor and praise. He did not forsake you, and He will not forsake you. If you're one of His children, He promised to go with you to the end of the age. The thing of it is, we just need to get busy working for Him, fellowshipping with one another, exhorting one another, and encouraging one another. And so we find the doctrine or the teaching of forgiveness. We find the doctrine or teaching of salvation. We find the doctrine or teaching of forsakeness uh, that, that he gave us. Three fantastic doctrines. If we apply them to our life, we can, we, we can grow thereby and have a better Christian life. And then number four, as we, this is the last one that we will address today, is the teaching or the doctrine of compassion. The teaching or the basic doctrine of compassion. Look at John 19, verse 26 and 27. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, that was John, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And he said unto the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. As Christ looked down from the cross, he saw his mother. He had great compassion, deep compassion. You say, Pastor, what does the word compassion mean? What is, it, what is compassion? The, the dictionary says it's a feeling of deep sympathy for another with a desire to help. The, the word in Greek simply means it's a feeling in your gut. A feeling in your gut. Oh, we see animals. Maybe some of them's abused, and God forbid nobody would abuse animals. But we see that little dog, that little puppy that has been mistreated. It's not hard for us to put our hands out, whistle for that puppy and come and embrace him and give him some compassion. I mean, animals, and, and then children especially. Oh, there's a lot of mistreated kids in America today and around the world that we need to have compassion for. We see these tel television ads re requesting aid and, and money and help for these organizations. And if you can give to it and, and it's worthwhile, do it. But make sure you check it out first. But it's, it's compassion is, I want to help you. I see the condition you're in. I see the problem you're having, and I feel a need to help you. I feel the desire to help you. If something just touches my heart, gets down in my gut, and I just need to touch them and do something about it. Oh, it's not hard to have the thought of compassion. Oh, I see something. Isn't that pitiful? Oh, if I could just do something for it. Oh, if I could just bring it to my house. Oh, if I could just bring that child to my house. Oh, if I could just bring that dog or that cat. And if I could just have some compassion, I would. Well, what's stopping you? You see... It's easy to have the thought of compassion, but it's hard to carry the plan of compassion or the thought of compassion out to real life. It's hard to do, it's hard to, to act on that thought of compassion. But listen to this. As Christ, our Redeemer, our Savior, our Lord, the sinless one, looked down from that tree, that cross, there he's dying few breaths left, and with his last breaths, breathing slowly, he looked down and saw Mary and John standing there. And I'm sure the thought, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he thought that both of them would need somebody to care for them in the trying days ahead. So in compassion, in compassion, he gave John, Mary, his mother. And Mary gave, Christ gave Mary to John to be a mother to him. We need to be compassionate of those around us. There's a lot of people in hurting conditions today. There's a lot of people hurting today. And we need to practice compassion in our everyday Christian life. You see, both of them would be alone without Christ. But why can't they be together in Christ as Mary 
acting as John's son and John acting as Mary's son. They're once again dying on the cross. Dying for you and I. Dying for all of mankind. Dying for others. Thinking of others and not just itself. Thinking of you and I. There's a song that goes this way. It says, when, I was on, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. I'm so glad of that. When he, Christ, was on the cross, I was on his mind. All the sinful mankind was on his mind. And he had compassion. Oh, it would have been so easy for him to call a legion of angels and take him off that cross. It would have been so, so easy for, for him to say, Lord, I can't take this cup in the Garden of Gethsemane. But no, from the time he was born, his death was planned. From the time he was born, not only was forgiveness planned and salvation planned, but compassion was planned. Compassion was planned. He is such a compassionate Savior. He had compassion on his mother and he had compassion on John to be her son thinking of somebody else. You know, we live in a world today of people who only think of themselves, only think of what's good for me and what can I do that will, will be for me. And it doesn't matter just as long as me, myself, and I get what I need. It doesn't matter. That's the reason so many churches are closing the doors today because people aren't coming there and giving their tithes and offerings as they should to the house of God. They're forsaking God's house. They're forsaking God's people. There's a story in the Bible that Christ teaches about a certain Samaritan. I'm not going to read the scriptures. You can read them for yourself in the book of Luke. Luke, Luke chapter 10, matter, matter of fact. There's a story of compassion. This Jew headed down to Damascus, maybe a businessman, maybe on a leisurely trip, maybe what doesn't tell us what he's going for. It's not important. And there on his trip, he fell among some robbers. Some highway men came and robbed him, beat him up rather badly, and left him to die on the side of the road, in the ditch. Just kicked that old broken body that they had broke just kicked him aside as if he was nothing but an old dog, just an old piece of dirt. And, and so they went on their way. And then, I'm sure, in his agony, he probably was calling out for help. And there came this certain Levite down the street, or, or a certain priest down the road, hearing his call for help, Seeing the need for compassion, he went around the other way, or he went to the opposite side of the road, probably, and said, I don't have time for that man. I don't have time for him. Just let him die. I don't need to get involved in this. So he went on, to, on down the road. And then there comes a Levite, a man of the law, a man who knew about compassion, a man who knew the teaching of God, as God had so graciously showed compassion to his ancestry, to the nation of Israel so many times. He came and he looked upon this broken man, this robbed man, this hurting, bleeding man. He stopped and he looked on him and he says, in his mind, I believe, he says, no, I, I, I really need to help him. But he says, no, I don't have time. So he goes, goes his way without having compassion. Two people see somebody hurting and go their way. But there was a third man, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he took and bound, bound up his wounds, and he poured the oil of healing upon those wounds. He picked him up in his arms, and he took him to his beast of burden, and he put him on that beast and took him to the end just down the road somewhere and paid for his care and paid for his being able to stay there until his wounds was mended. 
And he said this, if I owe you any more for this man, I will repay you when I come. We need to be compassionate. How many people do we look at in this world and say, oh, they deserve what they're getting. They deserve the, the, the way they live. And, and they get that they, they're the way they are because that's the way they live. No, that's the way they are because they're hurting. They need Jesus. How many of us are compassionate people? We need to show compassion in our everyday life. Quit looking at, at the, this world and start doing something about it. Quit looking at saviors, uh, at sinners, and present to them a savior. Quit being thoughtful of only ourselves, me, myself, and I. Nobody else matters. It's just me, my family. That's not what God teaches. Christ teaches us from the cross the doctrine of compassion. As we look today at forgiveness, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of forsake, forsakefulness, the doctrine of compassion. These are all four of the seven teachings that God Christ gave us from the cross. As I said earlier, we will look at these other three next week. But while he was dying on the cross, he was thinking of us. He was thinking of all mankind who had sinned and who had rejected him, who were sinners, sinners in the past, sinners today, and sinners in the future. He had everybody in his mind. You see, everybody needs forgiveness. Everybody. You say, preacher, I ain't got anything to be forgiven for. Oh, you just told something right there. You need to be forgiven for that statement. You see, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one that's righteous, no, not one. But I'm so thankful that the gift of God, but where God says in Romans, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Savior. You see, Everybody needs forgiveness and everybody needs saving and everybody needs somebody to take care of them and walk with them for the rest of their life and everybody needs some compassion. Everybody needs some compassion. Churches need to be more compassionate. Business people need to be more compassionate. Individuals need to be more compassionate. We need to practice these four teachings in our life. If we do, we'll have a much richer a much richer Christian walk. Christ gave himself for us on the cross at Calvary. And while they're dying for our sins, teaches us some lessons. Let me ask you this. Are you sharing those lessons? Are you sharing those teachings? Are they, have you applied them to your heart? Are you living that way in such a manner that other people will know that you're a Christian? That other people know that you have found these four teachings from the word of God? as Christ taught from the cross. Chris Tomlin wrote this song, Love Ran Red at the Cross. I'm just going to give you part of it today. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life in all for you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red, my sins are washed white. Listen to that. Where your love ran red, my sins are washed white. White in the blood of Jesus, made white by his cross, made white by his forgiveness, his salvation. Let's put these to practice in our life. If you've not, if you've not been living the way you need to, get right with Jesus. Confess your sins to him. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe you have never accepted Christ as your Savior. You've heard the gospel today. You've heard the teaching of the Word of God. You've heard the gospel. You've heard enough gospel today to save you and everybody else in this world of ours of sinful people. Why don't you accept Christ as your Savior? Bow your head right where you are. Confess Him as Lord. Why don't you say, Dear God, I believe Jesus Christ is your Son. I'm, I know I'm a sinner, and I know that there's salvation only in Christ. 
I accept your forgiveness, and I accept your Son as my Savior. Thank you for saving me. If you've prayed that prayer, if you've, if you've confessed Christ as your Savior, and you don't have a church home, we'll invite you to come to Woodland Heights. We'd love to have you for any of our services once this coronavirus is over, once it's done. And we'll go back to regular services. But may I say, my friend, God bless you. Thank you for watching our program today. Thank you for tuning our way. And I'm going to leave you with a blessing of a prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name we ask you, dear God, to bless those who have tuned our way today. Lord, maybe they've deliberately waited to the sermon time and they've been anxiously waiting to hear something from the Word of God. Thank you for those folks. And thank you for those that tell me every now and then when I see them that it's a blessing. Father, bless them as they listen. Bless them as they, Father, are blessed to, as we are blessed to share the gospel with them. And then, Father, I pray, Lord, if it's the one that's lost, don't know you as their Savior, may, Father, they fall in love with Jesus, fall out of love with sin. Take this message, as feeble as it's been, as, as simple as it's been, and follow the Lord, may Holy Spirit apply it to people's heart. Bless the church. Father, bless our people. I pray, dear God, blessings upon all of our folks as we can't get together anymore to worship for a while. May they still be faithful to you, faithful to the house of God when they can be. In Christ's name, amen.